Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from P.L. Combs Asian Art and Bitamount.com, located in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Today, we're going to have a look at the Sotheby sales from September, this uh, just last month. They had some great things. They had nice results. They had some odd things that didn't sell, which I don't quite understand, but that's the way it always goes. And we're also going to take a look at our friends down in Marietta, Georgia, at Eden, Eden Auction Galleries. These were the folks that we did a few pieces on a while ago who are offering a plethora of reproductions, copies, and fakes. But for now, let's start on an up note. We're going to take a look at important Chinese works of art at Sotheby's. They had some fabulous pieces, as you can see by the catalog. They had some great monochromes. We're also going to take a look over at this sale. This is a fun sale. If you don't have an endless wallet, this is an auction you might want to pay attention to. It's called Saturday at Sotheby's. They have some great things and things that the average person can afford. First up is lot number seven, an extremely fine and very rare Kangxi Claire de Lune, also known as Qian Lan, a sky blue uh, brush washer made during the late Kangxi period. These are extremely rare. They're rarer than the peach bloom examples by a good bit. Very few of them are in existence. If you have the opportunity, get yourself a copy of Decorative Arts Part 2, published by the National Gallery over 10 years ago. It has the Widener Collection in it, and they have many examples of these incredible Kangxi monochromes. Uh, I was fortunate enough to spend an afternoon there one time uh, getting to look at them all. It was quite incredible. Next up is Lot 8 and 9, a pair of uh, key long bowls that were purchased in Hong Kong prior to 1942 by Donald Ballantyne. The one on the left, as you can see, brought considerably more on the one on the right. And we'll take a look at them and see why. Um, we're going to zoom in a little bit. As you can see, the one on the left has a very, very even color. It's perfectly toned, uh, done with the, the soft, soft turquoise blue, beautifully done. The one on the right is a bit more dense. The color toning isn't quite as perfect. Uh, the potting is identical, but the uh, glaze uh, finish on it wasn't quite as good. And I think that's probably the reason why the other brought uh, many times more, though they were in the same collection for a long time, and this is the first time they've been offered for sale. Next up was this, was lot number 16, an incredibly fine uh, Yongchen Markin period uh, Daotsai enamel uh, medallion bowl. Uh, the, each medallion is decorated with uh, a flower. They were the peony, the lotus, the chrysanthemum, and the prunus. And they represent the four seasons. Uh, scholars often refer to them as the four gentlemen. The, the pattern of using these flowers emerged, became very popular back in the Song Dynasty and remained ever so. And uh, during the Yong Chen, they were used on these bowls and other, other uh, porcelains as well. This particular bowl measured eight inches in diameter, came from a good collection, and was in remarkably fine condition. It was a really superb example. As you can see, it pretty much blew the estimate to bits and uh, did extreme. Following that beautiful conical bowl was this, an incredibly fine Daosai enameled Yong Chen Markin period uh, dish. They refer to these as the five bats dish. Um, but what it really depicts is a scene uh, representing the seventh trial of Zhao Zheng, a disciple of the Eastern Han Dynasty celestial master Zhang Daoling, who is credited with founding the way of the celestial master's sect of Taoism. Zhao Daoling told his disciples that he would reveal the essence of the way to those who could obtain a peach from a tree growing sideways from a steep cliff. And only Zhao Zheng had the courage to carry out the task and return with the peach. While, the, while this particular dish illustrates the scene that he had to climb down, it doesn't depict him on it. Um, also, the inclusion of five bats uh, indicates the auspiciousness um, with which uh, these plates were revered and the story was held. It did very well. As you can see, it was estimated at uh, around 60 to 80,000. It brought the high end of the estimate, not a big surprise. It had been sold at Sotheby's Hong Kong in 1997. Then they came up with this. This is an incredibly great, another Yongshen Markin period piece, but this is an underglazed blue uh, ewer uh, done in a Middle Eastern metal form. It is uh, handleless. There's, these can also be seen with handles, uh, but this particular one was without. It is extremely rare. It turned up at Nagel's about uh, seven years ago where it was sold and then is now being re-offered here. And it did very well. It measures around 10 inches tall. 
It is exceptionally rare ewer, and it represents probably the very height of the imperial kiln output under Tang Ying during the uh, uh, 18th century. Uh, here you can see the mark on the lower left. We're going to add a photograph uh, with the ewer and the mark so you can see it a little more clearly. But these were superbly well done. It is thought that they often call these watering vases in China, uh, though they could also be used for pouring wine. The exact purpose was never recorded, actually, and they don't really know. But these do turn up on occasion, and they always bring a great sum of money, just as this one did, just shy of a million dollars. One of the surprises in the sale was this. It was a very fine Jiajing Markin period uh, uh, dragon vase in underglazed blue. It sold previously, the last time it was sold anyway, was at uh, Louis Joseph in Boston, Massachusetts. He was a well-known auctioneer and he handled some great estates. And he handled this particular vase. It's uh, exceptionally well potted and very carefully rendered. I think if it, if it weren't for the uh, Jiajing mark, many would assume it was made during the Qinlung period just exceptional all the way around from top to bottom with the large mature dragon in the clouds uh, flying along with the rue head border at the upper part of the mouth there. Just uh, a beautiful example. And on the back is a young dragon playing in the waves beneath and splashing around uh, playfully looking up, up towards the sky. Very typical. One of the big, big surprises with the sale was this yellow and underglazed blue uh, uh, Qinlung Markin period vase. Uh, there's a similar example in the collection of Sir Harry and Lady Garner. Uh, it was illustrated in their book. It had been loaned many times to exhibitions. It measured around eight inches tall. And what was beautifully done um, with this, these, the, the scrolling pattern around the body, the body flared out beautifully as well. But this beautiful lotus and chrysanthemum scroll, and then above it are these uh, 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 canthus leaves uh, accentuating the neck and then a gently flared mouth. Uh, all around, it was a great example. And one of the things that's interesting about this particular vase was if you notice that in certain spots that it's been highlighted with uh, later enamels. They say later in the catalog, they don't really say when, um, but here's a picture of the bottom of it. Beautiful, deep yellow, rich yellow, almost a green tone to it with this green enamel highlights, and then this very deep, deep cobalt blue. Just a great vase. While we're here, I thought I'd mention that, that lovely, deep uh, green, leaf green, uh, Chinlung Markin period uh, tea dust glaze vase. Also a great example, it brought uh, above its estimate, but the color of it was quite unusual. Very, very deep color and uh, uh, wonderfully potted throughout with a nicely sloping shoulder and very slightly uh, uh, flared uh, upper part of the neck there. Just a, a wonderful piece. And uh, monochromes tend to do very well these days. They've been doing well now for several years. And here's another example. The next lot that came up that caught our eye, and it did really well, was lot number 32, a very fine Famille Rose Jiajing Markin period boys at play vase, measured around 12 inches tall, and uh, was just filled with, with, with assorted symbols and, and, and messages on it. Uh, the fact that there were nine boys, it tells you that it was the wish of many Chinese families to have many children, but also the, the number nine is very symbolic in that it's notable uh, is it synonymous with the letter Ju, which is the character for a long and long-lasting life in perfect harmony um, uh, and eternity. eternity. They also were carrying rue scepters, one of them anyway, and it means as you desire and for all your wishes to come true. Another carrying a spear, which was symbolic of the uh, homophone for the grade you might be getting in your imperial examinations, which every family wanted their sons to take to get them a, a leg up in life, so to speak. Another was carrying a rod, suspending a chime, the character of which sounds similar to that of the word for celebration, and so forth. It was a very, very interesting vase. It was made early in the period, and it brought a very large price. The design first started during the Qinlung period. The next piece that came up was lot, uh, let's see here, lot number 33. It was a Famille Rose Three Abundances Bowl, um, also known as the Three Plenties. And on it were decorated with a peach, a pomegranate, and a citron. 
The peach was the symbol of longevity. The pomegranate symbolized descendants in progeny or having many children. And the citron symbolizes happiness and longevity. The uh, shading and coloration on this bowl was superb. It measured about six inches in diameter and was uh, really a terrific example. The next bowl we're going to look at is this one. It's a lot number 34. It was a very fine yellow ground for Milrose floral bowl, Dao Quan, Mark and period. The style of bowl was first developed during the late Kangxi period and continued to be made out through the entire Qing dynasty. It's beautifully decorated and this type of bowl, this particular decoration, places it in among the best of, the, of its type done at the imperial workshops. Exceptionally well done. The interior is also decorated with wufu or bats, which represent a, a, for the owner of the five blessings, longevity, health, wealth, love of virtue, and a peaceful death. It's just beautifully done all the way around, extremely well. Further down into the catalog came lot 60, which was this. It was a really large 17-inch Jiajing Markin period uh, Ming Dynasty dragon charger. It was beautifully done with sort of inky tones of two dragons opposing over the flaming pearl above a wave, crested ground uh, within a ring uh, border. It was exceptionally well done. There was a similar one was in the uh, Dr. Ip Lee co Yi collection years ago. And the side of the bowl reflected what was on the interior, again with more dragons and in a horizontal script, the uh, rain mark of the piece. Beautifully done. Among the jades that were sold, probably the most important one was lot number 67. It was a Shang Dynasty piece, extremely large notch disc, uh, very big, estimated at 60 to 80,000, as you saw it blew that estimate to pieces. Um, these discs form a very small but distinctive group, and they're defined by these deep indentations that divide the circumference into segments. The earliest examples have been found in, in the late Neolithic sites on the east coast of the Shandong province and in the west in Shangxi. Uh, they're extremely rare, and uh, they're worth looking up. Looking, if you like early jades, this is a type worth learning more about. Jessica Rawson, in her book Chinese Jades, did. Uh, quite a bit on them and there's some good illustrations. They come in a uh, pretty wide variety of sizes, but this one was a monster. It was among the biggest I've seen. Among the bronzes offered in the sale was lot number 70. Very unusual. It was a very rare pair. You don't see pairs of these very often of Shang Dynasty bronze ritual wine vessels, no less. They were estimated at 40 to 60,000, but I think they brought way over that estimate because it's a pair. And finding pairs of these is extremely unusual. They were beautifully decorated. They had uh, 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 wonderful uh, surface on them, too. They, they had a deep green patina with lots of nice little malachite encrustations on them. And they appeared to be in excellent shape. Um, here's the write-up over here on this side. They'd sold at uh, Sotheby some years ago at 1987 and then again in 2004. And they've been in collections ever since. And I guess somebody just had to have them, or a few people did. Arguably the most important bronze in this sale, and maybe one of the most important pieces in the entire sale, was this, lot number 72, an extremely rare buffalo figure done during the Western Zhao Dynasty. It's beautifully done, extraordinary patina, and the work on it is very typical of the uh, Zhao sculptures. Notice the wonderful sort of armor-plated body on it, and the animal has an extremely, ter has a terrific facial expression. You gotta love it. It's like somebody caught him walking through the woods and he turned his head. It had been sold previously by the Yamanaka Company and had been through a succession of prominent collections ever since. Here's a look at it. As I said, it was about 10 inches long and uh, had a great deal of surface on it and very powerfully potted, very powerful, powerfully uh, cast. Uh, just terrific. I love the face. you got to love the face and the deeply curled horns. Wonderful. Among the other rarities in this auction was this, an incredibly rare uh, uh, Tang Dynasty Sunkai decorated uh, Raitan cup. They don't turn up very often. This was lot number 76. 
They're extremely rare. Rydon cups were introduced to China through the Middle East, through Asia. Um, they were usually done in silver or other forms, and initially in China during the Han Dynasty, when they first arrived, were carved out of um, ox horns and cattle horns. This one was done in the Tang Dynasty, and it's interesting that they replaced the, uh, the handle with a dragon's head, and it has this very fine stippled ground, um, beautifully done all the way around, extremely rare. On the 16th of September, they held the Saturday at Sotheby's Asian Art Sale, which was an interesting one. It was done in a couple of segments. And this is a sale where the average collector, uh, with not an unlimited wallet, can find some terrific things. They had pages and pages and pages of things that could be bought for well under $20,000, something often for under $5,000. Here are just a few examples. And we picked out one or two things for you to look at, to think about. There was this. This was a rather nice uh, 13 and a half inch Kung Shi uh, iron red and gilt jar. It was beautifully potted, well shaped, and uh, went for a, a modest amount of money, about $4,300. Or you had this, this very large Kung Shi Famille Ver uh, jar, 22 inches tall with lid. Uh, I may have had a repair or two, I don't know, but it looks like a heck of a deal to me. Or you had this, this really unusual pair of Blanc de Chine of De Wah, uh Montgolfier uh, balloon ewers. These are extremely rare. They don't turn up very often. And they had a pair in this sale. So there's something to think about the next time Sotheby's runs these auctions. Don't overlook them. You might find something for a reasonable price. Now on to Eden Galleries. As many of you recall, month or so ago, we did a few blogs and mentioned them in a few videos about what's going on at this place. Uh, it is our opinion that the pieces they offer are not authentic. They are all reproductions. And uh, this is just my personal opinion. But you can decide for yourself. Uh, this is their website. They have some uh, rather uh, big claims on here regarding the age and authenticity of the things that they're selling. And uh, I, I'm not going to accuse them of any wrongdoings. We can just maybe give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they're being misled by uh, their consigners about the quality, age, and uh, so forth of their items. This is a classic case. It's a Jean, supposedly a Jean D. Bowl with, a, with, a, with an estimate running around the price of a cheap export bowl, of about $1,000. You can buy this. So we all know the authentic examples of these run well into high six figures and into seven figures. Um, this particular bowl is a very desirable type and um, will probably hook a few unwary, unsuspecting buyers. There are also a number of pieces in this auction that were in their last auction that allegedly sold for a lot of money and didn't either get paid for or maybe didn't sell at all. And then you have this, another chi supposedly Qing example, 18th to 19th century. These are brand new. These are just brand new copies. Um, they're no good, in my opinion. The uh, enamels are incorrectly done. The coloration is poor. The, uh, the outlining is bad. The uh, yellow grounds on them is just uh, off. And uh, finding a pair of these with a, an estimate of, you know, eight to $1,200 or whatever they have on them is ridiculous. And then you have this. This is, they are claiming, they're advertising as a Yuan Dynasty Yuhu Chu Ping. As we all know, these sell for into the millions. All right? Uh, they are extremely rare and do not turn up on the market very often. And yet these folks seem to get rare Ming and Yuan pieces almost from an endless supply. There's the foot ring of it. Uh, that is not the right foot you want to see on one of these vases, I can tell you that. Very, very inaccurately done. Um, the enamel is poor. It's a copy. That's all there is to it. And then you have this, another Zuan D moon flask with a, with, a, with a bird on it, mark and period no less. Uh, absolutely a brand new piece. It is not being advertised properly. It's in the style of, but certainly not an authentic example. There's the, there's the uh, mark on it, and there's the foot rim. That's a brand new foot, ladies and gentlemen. There's nothing more you can say about it. That's what it is, all right? I'm not going to review the other stuff that they have because I suspect that if you accept all this bad porcelain, you're probably accepting bad everything else. And then you have this, this blatant fraud of a Yuan Dynasty charger. 
were this piece authentic, you all know what it would bring. It would bring in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, this one has a little tiny reserve on it. You could buy it for next to nothing. Nobody in their right mind would do that. You know, that's how it is. And there's the back of it. With an underglazed red, no less, seal mark on it, which they didn't do, okay? It was an Islamic script. Occasionally they had Islamic script on them, but they were done in cobalt, not red. All right? This is just a, also the decoration. Everything about it is just wrong. There's no other way to say it. There's a picture of the bottom of it again with that oh-so-common burnt bottom, trying to give it the look of authenticity. It's just embarrassing to even look at these things. All right, and uh, then what else do we have here? Oh yeah, here's a, here's a, a view of this some of the sail, and there's this supposedly a Kangxi underglazed red dragon base. All right, this is this, the shape is wrong, the red is the wrong color, um, the decoration is inaccurately done, the dragon's expression is wrong. Um, the list of what's wrong with this is too long to go on with right here but it's not a, a correct piece, that's all there is to it. There's the foot rim, um, the foot is wrong, uh, the mark is accurately drawn, I give them that, it's a nicely drawn mark, they did a good job with marks, and, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a fake, okay? And uh, we're gonna mosey on now over to, what's the next piece? Oh yeah, these two, does everybody remember these from the last sale? They went through the sale last time, I think they, they claimed they sold for 47,000, perhaps they didn't get paid for. It. Maybe somebody's check got lost in the mail, at any rate. And then you have this, a large um, dragon uh, celestial vase, uh, probably uh, Chin Lung looking in style, but it's new. It's a brand new copy. Um, were this authentic, you all know it would go into seven figures. Uh, beautifully decorated, nice looking dragon, but it's a fake. There's the foot. That is not the foot or the bottom you want to see on one of these. It's uh, They've scuffed it up a little to look like it's been on a stand for a while, but it's not real. And then you have this, of all things, a uh, copy of a uh, oh, probably young low period, young low period uh, uh, grapes pattern bowl. There's a lot wrong with this. The, the cobalt is one the wrong color, and the uh, rim decoration on it, instead of being the typical crashing waves decoration, they took the rim decoration off of another plate um, from that period and put it on here using little scrolling vines and flowers. See if we get back to that rim and you can see it again. But at any rate, it's, it's, it's a copy and not a good copy at that. All right, and then we'll mosey through. Here's a few more pieces they have. Um, all of them look very suspect to me. And um, I'm hoping that uh, anybody who sees this before the sale will be smart enough not to bother participating. And that's it for this video. Hope you found it interesting and I hope you learned something. There's some interesting things to think back on. Come back anytime and look at it again for more information. And uh, have a great week and uh, we'll see you next time.